Ray Suarez picks up the story from there with a preview of key events and athletes and how things look in London tonight. And for that, we're joined from London by Christine Brennan. She's covering her 15th Olympics for USA Today and ABC, among others. And Christine, now that we're just in advance of the opening ceremonies with so many athletes and so many events, are there certain competitions where the venues are already selling out, where there's buzz in advance of these games? Oh, absolutely. In fact, even just the streets of London today, Ray, uh, with the torch going through, I've covered a lot of these and I've never seen that many people. And the locations, the backdrops, Buckingham Palace, uh, Westminster Bridge, all of, you know, Big Ben, it, it's really extraordinary. But, but your question about the venues, swimming will get going on Saturday and Michael Phelps and Ryan Lochte, uh, everyone in the world knows about these two Americans, especially, of course, Phelps from uh, four years ago in Beijing, and uh, gymnastics. And, of course, the Brits are all about cycling and rowing. And so I, I really feel like this has, in the last day or two, is almost caught on fire. I mean, there's something about this Olympics that I don't remember this kind of buzz going into uh, so much of a buzz going into previous games. American viewers are able to consume more of the games than ever before because of the way they're being delivered. So uh, why don't you pull up a seat on the virtual couch next to them and help them figure out what to watch over the next couple of days. Well, I think we may call this the Twitter Olympics or the live streaming Olympics when it's all over. The days of uh, coming home and watching the network uh, from 8 to 11, not missing a, a second of it, those days are long gone. And so NBC, of course, is the rights holder for the United States, and they're going to be doing a lot of live streaming. All of us who are not rights holders are also going to be doing uh, tweeting and on Facebook and blogging, and, and it's going to be instantaneous and uh, I guess I would say to the fans, uh, you can probably gear your coverage what you want. You will be able to find out the, t the split times of races, uh, preliminary swimming, the gymnastics, who falls off the balance beam and who doesn't. And, and that's going to come into your handheld device instantaneously. We've never seen an Olympics like this. Along with Phelps versus Lochte that you've already mentioned, there are some dramatic matchups shaping up in the various events, including in the 100-meter dash. Well, that's right. Usain Bolt is back. I think people may remember him for the guy that was kind of running sideways the last 10, 15 meters in Beijing. Well, he's back. He's got uh, his Jamaican countrymen who are going to give him a run for his money. The joke is that it's the Jamaican National Championships, the men's 100 meters. But uh, track and field, absolutely. Gymnastics, the U.S. women against China. Of course, four years ago, China won a very controversial gold medal in that team competition. The United States women want to get that gold medal back. And uh, we'll see these pint-sized athletes competing as if they're uh, offensive linemen in the NFL in terms of how hard and how strongly they will compete, for the, especially for the Americans, to win that gold medal. South African athlete Oscar Pistorius has been fighting for a place in the Olympic track and field competition, and he finally got it. Not the Paralympics but the Olympics. Tell us more. That's right. He runs on two carbon fiber legs, cheetah legs as they're known. Uh, he had both of his uh, legs uh, amputated be below his knee when he was 11 months old. And so here's a man who some say he's cheating because he has uh, these synth synthetic legs. Of course, it sounds bizarre, doesn't it, Ray, to say that a man who hasn't had his legs since he was 11 months old is somehow cheating and somehow has an advantage. To me, the Oscar Pistorius story is a story of inclusion. It's a story of telling every disabled athlete or a, athlete with some kind of an issue uh, physically that they are welcome in the greatest event of the world. But the floodgates haven't opened. It's not as if people with rockets on their feet are now going to show up at the Olympic Games. Pistorius is one of a kind, one in a generation. He will be fascinating to watch in the men's 400 meters on the track and also in the South African relay, the 4 by 400 meters later in the Games. London can be, at the best of times, a tough place to travel through. And the Olympic organizers have worked very hard to get large numbers of people from place to place. Is it working? Uh, I'm going to give them about a C-plus right now, and of course the games haven't even started yet. I've been in town almost a week. It is tough to get across town. Uh, this will be the most challenging Olympics in terms of going from place to place. Beijing had everything basically in walking distance, the big events anyway, swimming, track and field, gymnastics. Here to go from gymnastics to track and field, it could take an hour and a half. And uh, there are Olympic lanes. Uh, this is something that's happened in Atlanta, Barcelona, L.A. back in 1984. 
Uh, so there is a way to get the athletes from place to place. I don't think we're going to see too many traffic jams tying up athletes, but fans, spectators, and just people who happen to be in London, wow. I, I think this may be the most clogged Olympics that certainly I've seen going back to L.A. in 84. Is the security intrusive? There are 25,000 security people, including 7,000 soldiers. That's right, and that's certainly been reported, and Seb Coe, who I've spoken with, the man in charge of the Olympics, is, feels very good. He told me today that they have done everything they can do, and they feel that they are in good shape heading into the opening ceremonies. This is the thing you don't know about, and of course, in 2005, London uh, won the Olympic Games. The very next day, the London transit system was uh, targeted by suicide bombers, and 50-some people were killed. That was the very next day. Ray, there was never a uh, connection made between the bombings and the announcement the day before that London won the games. But I think it's in the back of everyone's mind that uh, this is a melting pot in all the best ways, a democracy in, and a, a, a free country as opposed to Beijing and China four years ago. So thank goodness for that. But with that comes all of the possible dangers of a society that is open and uh, where people can come and go freely. And I don't think the security is overwhelming at all. Um, in fact, in many parts of the city, you can go and you don't see any extra security. It's around the Olympic Park, where I am now. That's where you, it's an armed camp. And I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that's as it should be, knowing the history of the Games. Christine Brennan, good to talk to you. Thanks for joining us. Right. Thank you very much.